All right, welcome back everybody. Today we're gonna to be doing section 14.2, which is all about limits and continuity. Thankfully this one, well, maybe not so thankfully, this one is not as mind blowing as the last one with uh, uh, functions of several variables, um, but it can be a little bit technical because we're talking about limits and we've got to talk about the formal definition of a limit. So it can get a little bit rigorous, a little bit technical. Let's go ahead and get started and take a look at the overview. So uh, we're going to talk about limits in general. We're going to get the precise definition of a limit of a function of several variables. Um, we'll talk about some handy limit tools. I don't know if you remember from Calc 1, that was kind of like one of the funnest parts was once you got all the tricks, it was a lot easier to calculate limits. And then we'll finish up by talking about continuity. All right. So here's the, the, here's the deal. Now that we're working in higher dimensions, we need to be able to talk about limits of functions of several variables. Um, we need to find a way to generalize the notion of a limit to these multivariable functions. Um, if you remember from Calc 1, with functions of a single variable, this limit exists if and only if the left, wait, yeah, if and only if the left and the right-hand limits exist and are equal, right? So that was an important point about limits. You had to look at the limit as you came from the left. You had to look at the limit as you came from the right. You needed to be sure they both existed and they needed to be equal. And if that was the case, then we could say that the limit as you approached A existed. Um, yeah, so in other words, when we take a limit, the result should be the same no matter if we came from the left or the right. That was kind of the, the moral of that whole idea. Now with functions of a single variable, we talk about limits at a number. With functions of two variables, we talk about limits at a point, all right? And here's the catch. There are lots of ways to approach a point in the plane. And generally speaking, there are lots of ways to approach a point in space. So here's an example. Here's the point. Let me highlight this. This is the point A comma B right here. Oops, right there. But there are infinitely many ways you could approach that point in the plane. We're not restricted to just one axis anymore. We have a whole plane to work in. So I could come at that point from here. I could come at it from here. I could come at it using a straight line. I could come at it wiggling around as I go, right? I could come, I could even come in as a spiral, you know? There we go, those kinds of things. So here's the catch. With multivariable functions, or for now, two variable functions, in order for the limit to exist, it must exist from any direction, any direction. So that means that your analysis and your investigation of the limit needs to account for an approach from any direction. And this can be tricky because you might even be able to show that if you approach from infinitely many directions, that the limit exists. But that does not mean that the limit exists because you can't just, even if you show it's true for infinitely many, you have not necessarily shown that it's true for all directions. We're going to see that in this, uh, in this section in just a few minutes. Um, so this is where the precise definition of a limit really, really is important. So I, I do hope that your Calculus 1 professor or your Calculus 1 teacher talked about the precise definition of a limit. Um, it is basically the, the necessary apparatus to make the notion of limits rigorous. Because even though limits can be very intuitive, sometimes that intuition leads you down the wrong path, or it will lead you to a conclusion that is false, that's not actually a valid or not, not a sound conclusion. So the precise definition is important. And here's what it is for R2. And then we're going to look at it in, in Rn in just a moment here. So let's start with two variables. So we have a function f of two variables whose domain d includes points that are arbitrarily close to the point a comma b. Remember, limits the, the, the function does not need to be defined at the point for the limit to exist. We just need to be able to get arbitrarily close for that limit to exist. Then we say that the limit of x comma y as x comma y approaches a comma b is L. And we write this, the limit as the point x comma y goes to a comma b of f of x comma y equals L. That's what we write down. And that occurs if and only if this condition is true. So for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if x and y are in your domain 
and the distance <laughs> the, the the distance between a comma b and x comma y is smaller than delta then the distance between the output and the limit is smaller than epsilon yes so this is one that i do want you to ponder and read over a few times especially if you haven't seen the precise definition of a limit for a while so think about it for a minute and ponder it <clears throat> Okay, let's talk a little more about this, and then we'll get the more general result in just a moment here. Um, let me try to make some sense of what's going on. So for one, this is, this is the statement of, of the formal definition of a limit. So we're saying that for all epsilon greater than zero, there is some delta such that, you know, for points that are in the domain, if this distance is small, then this distance is small. Um, for those of you that have, that have taken me for Calc 1, Calc 2, even pre-calculus in, in some senses, um, really we're just talking about uh, as you get close to this point, your outputs get close to this value. That's really what it's, what it's saying. Epsilon is often called a tolerance or an error. And so what we're saying is that no matter what tolerance we're given, we can always get a little bit closer to the point and then the output of our function will be within tolerance of the limit. That's what it's really saying. So that, that's basically it. Um, now, the caveat here, not even a caveat really, just the difference here compared to what we had talked about in the past is this is just the distance formula. So when you're in one dimension, the distance formula is just absolute value. So if you remember from Calc 1, this said this, right? Now that we're in we're in two dimensions, we we need to use the more general definition of distance, which is the distance formula, and that's why we're using this now because this distance is not single directional or bi-directional; it's any directional. So no matter which way you approach the point, the distance is getting small, and if the distance gets small, then this distance in, between outputs gets sufficiently small. All right. Oh yeah. No, notice another thing. Uh, this definition does not refer to, I'm sorry, it, re it does not refer to direction. That's kind of just what I was saying. It doesn't matter the direction. All that matters is the distance because the limit should exist no matter which direction you approach from. Um, so if that makes sense, extending it to higher dimension is really straightforward. It's kind of the same idea. So if we've got a function of n variables and f is defined on a subset of Rn, then we would write this, the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l means that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that for all x in our domain, um, uh, if this distance is small, then this distance is small. So this is actually, it looks almost identical to the definition in one dimension. The only difference now is we are talking about n-dimensional vectors. And this symbol right here is referring to the n-dimensional Euclidean distance, which we talked about, uh, oh geez, back in section 12.1, I think, like the first, the first section. Um, so here, this absolute value symbol is really just indicating n-dimensional Euclidean distance. So this, a little messy here, oops. <laughs> We're talking about this, but for n variables. All right. Um, some important things. Uh, we actually saw this in one of the activities and we saw this in one of the sections. Uh, this right here and this right here describe solid balls in Rn and R respectively. So consequently, these sets are often called the delta and epsilon balls. Uh, math majors, you will talk about these a lot. So if any of you are going to get a degree in math or if any of you study topology, oof, actually, Shouldn't even, yeah, 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 because it's, well, okay, let's just say if you ever study metric spaces, which many of you will, we often call the sets that satisfy these conditions the, the delta balls and the epsilon balls. Yeah, this is basically a ball centered at A whose radius is less than delta, and this is a ball centered at L whose radius is less than epsilon. And that's pretty much it. And we can talk more about that in class if you are interested. Uh, here's kind of a visual depiction of what's going on. This can help, help build your intuition. Remember, for two variable functions, our domain is a region in the plane, right? And let's say we have a point A comma B 
uh, that we can get arbitrarily close to in our domain. It doesn't have to be included in the domain, but we have to be able to get arbitrarily close to it. So you could think of our domain as like a punctured region. It's a region that just has a single hole punctured in it if necessary. If the point is actually in the domain, great. But what we're going to do is <laughs> no matter what tolerance we're given, we can basically get close enough to that point within our domain such that our outputs of our function are getting closer to the limit L in our range. That's what it's saying. So this is another time where I want you to kind of stare at this and just ponder what it's saying for a moment. And then I'll show you the next picture right next to it. Okay. All right. Let's look at it in 3D. Oops. Here we go. Here's another example. So down here is the point A comma B. This is the delta ball. That's the delta ball. In this case, because our, our domain is two-dimensional, the ball is a, is a disk, right? It's a two-dimensional disk. Um, and basically, if we, <laughs> if we are pretty close to L, then we can find a delta ball that keeps us pretty close to A comma B. So here is the, the point in space, right? And as, as epsilon closes in on L, our delta ball can shrink to, to nothing, can shrink to, to zero in, in radius. And if we can do that no matter what epsilon we're given, if we can always find this delta ball where this is true, then the limit exists. That's what it means. OK. Um, Yes, so this one we're going to do together. So this one is maybe a little too difficult to try right off the bat, but I encourage you to try it if you would like to. But if not, let's just talk about it right now. Let's prove that this limit, the limit as x, y approaches 0, 0 of this function is equal to 0 using the precise definition of a limit. And if you remember from Calc 1, the way that you did that was you started with an arbitrarily given epsilon, and then you had to find a delta that depended on epsilon, and then you had to build that inequality. So here we go. <laughs> Suppose that epsilon is given. So we, were, we are given an arbitrary tolerance. Then what we need to do is we need to find a delta greater than 0, such that if this distance is less than delta, then this distance is less than epsilon. That's the goal. And this is where things, you have to get a little bit creative. So first, I did some simplification. What are we trying to prove? If this is true, then this is true. This is the goal. We need to find the delta. We need to find the delta on our own. And this is a lot of what analysis is like. So for math majors, if you, you'll take a real analysis course, and you'll do this kind of thing in your undergraduate real analysis course. And you can do this forevermore in any analysis course. All right, so here's the goal. This is what we're allowed to work with. This is what we need to get, OK? Now, here is the clever part. This, this type of proof always takes a little bit of cleverness. That's why they can be difficult. Notice that x squared is obviously less than or equal to x squared plus y squared, right? y squared is positive. So if I add a positive number to a positive number, it's, I, it's greater than or equal to just one of those positive numbers. Now, consequently, as long as x and y are both not 0, then we can divide both sides of this inequality by x squared plus y squared and get this result. This is really handy. So let me highlight this for a minute. There we go. So this, we know, has to be less than or equal to 1. Why is this so helpful? Well, oops, it appears <laughs> in this inequality right here. All right, there we go. So right away, we already have part of this showing up. So we can actually say that this is less than or equal to 1. Again, as long as x or x, x comma y is not equal to 0 comma 0, which is OK, because remember limits. Limits are not about plugging in the number. <laughs> that only happens if continuity holds. Limits are about getting arbitrarily close to the number, but not necessarily getting to the number. OK, so moving along. Uh, playing around with this a little bit. This thing, 
is equal to this thing. I just kind of stretched it out a little bit or like I moved things around, massaged them so that we can see the pieces a little more clearly, right? This we know is less than or equal to one. So this expression here has to be less than or equal to three times absolute value y times one, which is three times absolute value of y. But remember, the absolute value of a number is the same as squaring the number and then taking the square root. So we can rewrite this as this. Now, by the same argument I made on the previous slide, y squared has to be less than or equal to x squared plus y squared. So this has to be less than or equal to this, which means this has to be less than or equal to this. OK, this is the beautiful part. So this is, this is the tricky part. So coming up with it is the tricky part. But now this is the beautiful part. Observe that this is exactly the expression that we are allowed to work with. Let me go back one slide. This, actually, I should do a different color here. I'll use blue. This is exactly the expression that we are allowed to work with. And now we have it right here. So we found a way to relate this to something that we know about. Something, something, yeah, we found a way to relate this to delta. So what are we going to do? We're going to choose our delta to basically leverage this connection so that we get epsilon out of it, and that's all we need to do. So we're going to choose delta to be epsilon over 3. Then whenever this is true, this distance, which simplifies to this, which we just showed is less than or equal to this, has to be less than 3 delta, because this right here is less than delta. But we chose delta to be epsilon over 3. So delta becomes epsilon over 3. The 3 is cancel, and we get epsilon, and we are done. That was what we were trying to prove. Yeah, we found a delta. So given an arbitrary epsilon, we found a delta such that whenever this distance is small, this distance is less than epsilon. Done. All right. So those are tricky proofs. Those are tricky proofs. Uh, again, math majors, you will do these types of proofs a lot when you get into a real analysis course. The, I guess the takeaway from all of this is we can take these intuitive ideas of limits and we can make them wholly rigorous so that we're not just relying on you know, highfalutin intuition for this stuff. OK, now, if you remember from Calc 1 also, Nobody wants to have to do this every single time they prove that a limit exists or anything like that, right? Nobody really wants to do that. But the point is we can do it if we really need to. So what's good is that, well, most of the stuff that you remember from Calc 1, most of the limit techniques extend. So that makes things much, much nicer. Um, here, we're going to show that this limit does not exist. And this is one that, oh, let me see. Maybe ponder this one for a minute. You don't have to try to work this one out on your own, but just ponder it for a minute. We're going to show that this limit does not exist. OK. So if you want to show that a limit does not exist, then what you need to show is that if you approach this point from, we'll say, two different directions, you get two different results. That is the idea. Um, oh, wait, before I do that, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me do one more thing. I forgot I have all these Mathematica examples here. Let me do, let's go back to this for just a minute. We proved this. This part will be quick. So we actually proved that this limit is 0. Let me show you what it looks like graphically. Here we go. So here was that function. This is what the function looks like. And now you can see that as you approach 0, 0, 0, the origin, right? The, the limit exists. So if I come this way, the limit is 0. If I come this way, the limit is 0. If I come this way, the limit is 0. If I come this way, the limit is 0. So in this case, you can kind of see the limit is actually 0. In fact, yeah, yeah, the, the limit is 0. Maybe a question that we can answer later. Is it continuous? Is this function continuous at the origin? Think about it. You can tell me in class. OK, <laughs> let's go back to our next example. Um, we're going to show this limit does not exist. So the way you do that is you've got to find two different approaches that disagree. 
So you might have remembered this from Calc 1 too. Like uh, if you think of the function, uh, oops, absolute value of x over x. Yeah. Right. And then you approach zero from two different directions and you find that the limit doesn't exist, right? Same kind of thing here. We need to find two different directions where if we approach it from this direction, we get a number. And if we approach it from this other direction, we get a different number. That's the goal. So here's how we're going to do that. Um, let's approach the origin along the x-axis to start. So if we're approaching along the x-axis, that means the y-coordinate will always be 0. So we can convert this two-variable limit into a one-variable limit. So our limit here becomes this limit, because what we're doing is we're setting y equal to 0. So this becomes 0, this becomes 0, uh, and then this is our limit. So now we're just doing a one, like a one dimensional limit. We're doing the limit as x goes to zero of this, which is just the limit as x goes to zero of one, which is one. Okay, so this means if we approach along the x-axis, we get the number one. Now, let's try to approach not along the y-axis, but the, along the line y equals x. So here, like, let me pause for a minute. If we had instead approached along the, what is it, y-axis, Ooh, would that have worked actually? Hmm, might have worked. Did I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess it would, because if you approach along the y-axis, that means x is going to be 0. And then you'll get negative 1. So we could have approached along the y-axis and gotten a different result. But again, we have to find and let's do a different one. So let's approach along the the line y equals x. There we go. So if we're approaching along the line y equals x, our y coordinate will also be x. So now our limit becomes this limit, except now all these y's are x's. x squared minus x squared is zero. So limit as we approach the origin is zero, which is not equal to one. So since these two limits don't agree, the limit does not exist. So all it takes to prove a limit does not exist is that two different approaches disagree, and you're done. Now, <laughs> that's maybe uh, de deceptively, it's, it may be a bit deceptive to say that, because it can be hard to find two different approaches that don't agree, as we'll see in a few minutes. Let's look at it on Mathematica. Here we go. Yeah, so this is what the function looks like. <laughs> right so what did we do first we approached along the x-axis is that right yeah we approached along the x-axis so check this out if you look at the top of this image if we approach along the x-axis the function approaches the number one right so even if i come along here or come along here the function approaches the number one then we instead approach the long, along the line y equals x. So that is the diagonal. It's a little bit harder to see. <laughs> the diagonal is like right here. Here's the x-axis. Here's the y-axis. So wait, let me turn it. There we go. I should do this, yeah. So if we approach along this diagonal, we're going to end up at 0. So coming this way or coming this way, we end up approaching the number 0. Um, this function is actually not continuous at 0, which is a little bit of a, 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 a reveal for the previous question I asked. It's not continuous at the origin because if x and y are both 0, we're dividing by 0. Can't do that. Can't be continuous at the origin. But we're approaching the number 0 as we approach along the line y equals x. Similarly, if we approach instead along the y-axis, let me tip it this way, Look at the bottom. If we approach along the y-axis, this approaches the number negative 1, just like so. Hey, don't look down there. <laughs> just like so. So here's an example where we actually found three different directions that we could take, and none of the limits agree that the, the limit can't exist. So the limit at 0, 0 does not exist. And that's what we were showing right there. OK. Now let's do this one. Does this limit exist? Uh, this one I do want you to try. So see how you think about it for a minute. Think about how you would try to approach the point. We don't know if it exists or not. 
Okay, now say something out loud to yourself. Haven't done this yet. Remember, you got to say something out loud to give your brain that feedback. Say something about, out loud about how you would start. Right. And now try to work it out on your own. Um, remember, if it exists, well, if it doesn't exist, you should be able to find two different directions to approach that disagree. If it does exist, then you should be able to show that it exists no matter where you approach the point. Okay, and now let's look at it together. All right, um, let's see. This one is x squared plus y to the fourth. Well, one thing I can tell right away, we haven't talked about continuity yet, but one thing I can tell right away is that it is not continuous at the origin because if I plug in zero, zero down here, I get zero and you can't divide by zero. So it's not continuous. The limit might exist though. So let's try this. Um, here we're going to save some time. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to approach from a different angle than just the x and the y axis in the previous example. Let's approach it from any non-vertical line that passes through the origin, a line of the form y equals mx. So what I'm saying is if this is the, if this is the xy plane, rather than basically saying, hey, let's approach this way and then let's approach this way, I'm saying, let's just encompass approaching from any non-vertical line. Oops, non-vertical line, yeah. There we go. So I'm saying, come at the origin from any non-vertical line and let's see what, what limit we get, all right? So any non-vertical line passing through the origin has this form. So we're gonna plug that in. So f of x comma y becomes f of x comma mx. So replace y with mx. Do some simplification and you get this. Right, now our limit is of a single variable. So now we can just take the limit as x approaches zero. So as x approaches zero, this approaches zero. <laughs> there we go. So this you know, may, may, suggest, or you, you may suggest that, hey, maybe the limit does exist. We just found infinitely many paths that say the limit is zero. My question to you is, is that sufficient? Are we done? Does the limit exist? What do you think? <laughs> All right, now say something out loud to yourself, to your peer, to your colleague, to your group mates. What do you think? Did we just show the limit exists? All right, so the bad news is we did not. We did not show that the limit exists yet. Even though we found infinitely many paths along which we could travel and get to the same limit, that's not enough. That's just not enough. Um, oh, well, here, even if we approach from the y-axis, check this out. If you approach along the y-axis, you're going to get zero again. But it's deceptive. Just because you found infinitely many ways that work does not mean that every way works. Yes, yes, so this is the caveat. Uh, basic, basic idea is even if you have a good example, that does not mean it's true in all cases. So check this out. Let's approach along a different path. Let's approach the limit along the parabola x equals y squared. Yeah, let's approach from x equals y squared. For, yeah, so for x, y not equal to 0, 0, our function becomes this. f of x comma y becomes y squared, f of y squared comma y, plug in y squared, you get this, you get this, which simplifies to 1 half. The limit as we approach along this parabola is 1 half, which is not 0, and thus the limit does not exist. There it is. Weird, huh? weird stuff. We're going to look at a picture here to make some more sense of it, but this is why this can be treacherous. We found infinitely many approaches that said the limit was zero, but all it takes is one approach where the limit disagrees for the limit to not exist. And that might seem cheap, like, or it might seem like a cop-out, like, what, you know, like, why is just one is going to make everything fail? Wait till you see the picture. Wait till you see the, the graph of this function. <clears throat> here we go. This is the graph of this function. <laughs> this is what this looks like. Okay, here we go. All right, so pretty funky looking. Take a look at it from the top. 
Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. You've got this parabolic behavior, right? <laughs> so if I approach it from a line, any line, oops, if I approach it from any line, they all go to zero. If I go straight this way or straight this way or straight this way or straight this way, everything goes to zero. But if I approach along this mountain ridge that you can see approximated here, if I approach along this mountain ridge, it doesn't go to zero. It goes to one half. And once again, remember this is a computer approximation. So the computer can't actually process this because what's happening is there's a there's very, very different behavior right at the origin, but that different behavior is only manifesting when you approach along this parabola or this parabola down here. So you see, here's another one down here. So even though you could approach it along any straight line and get to zero, if you approach it along, if you if you approach it along either of these parabolas, you get positive one half or negative one half. So the limit does not exist. Limit does not exist. Crazy. Okay, back to the slides here. Um, so some handy limit tools. So now that we've seen the treachery going on with taking these limits, and we have to be u uber careful about all this stuff. One way of evaluating limits of two variable functions is with polar coordinates. And we're going to use that in just a moment here. Polar coordinates are great because you can talk about approaching from like a almost like a circular restriction as you get to a point. And that circular restriction encompasses all possible trajectories, right? Because you're basically just talking about getting closer in radius, I'll say. Um, yeah, so converting to polar coordinates allows us to take the limit as the radius of a circle goes to zero instead of as a single path approaches from a single trajectory. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but also all the limit laws from Calc 1 can be extended to multivariable functions they still hold, including the squeeze theorem. So easy examples. Um, um, oh yeah, limit of, limit of x as you approach a comma b is a. Limit of y as you approach a comma b is b. Limit of a constant is just that constant. So all of that stuff you know and love about limits from Calc 1 still holds, which is great. All right. Now let's try to use one of our techniques here. And this one I do want you to try on your own. And I'm going to give you the hint right out. So maybe I'll say think about it for a minute. How do you think you would find this limit? OK. And then I want to give you the hint. Um, try to convert it to polar coordinates and see what you get. All right, here we go. We're going to do this one together now. Um, this is the beauty of polar coordinates. We could try all sorts of different trajectories. Even if we found infinitely many paths that show the limit is blah, that doesn't mean the limit is blah. So we're going to convert to polar coordinates. So recall that the formula for polar coordinates formulas, the isomorphism equations, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. So we're going to convert everything to r, r cosine theta, r sine theta. And the beauty here is that theta, in this case, won't matter. <laughs> the angle won't matter. What will matter is the radius. So here's the conversion. We plug those formulas in here. And now we don't need to worry about the angle of approach. We're just going to worry about a radius of a circle shrinking to 0. So notice the change here. This limit was as x, y approaches 0, 0. Now it's the limit as r approaches 0 from the positive direction, because we're taking a radius and shrinking it to nothing. All right, here's x, here's y, here's x, here's y, and then algebraic massage. So factor out an r cubed can cancel two of these, you're left with r. And again, this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what angle we're coming from. All that matters is what happens when the radius goes to 0. And in this case, you get 0 times whatever, which is 0. So the limit is 0 in this case. This limit actually is 0. Let's take a look at it. Here it is. There we go. Doesn't matter which way I approach, the limit will be zero. Cool stuff. So polar coordinates can help. Ah, don't peek at the next one. 
<laughs> okay, um, moving along. We're actually almost done here. Continuity is not so bad. Um, now we can actually define what continuous means. You need that, that rigor of limits to be able to define continuity in a meaningful way. Um, we say that a function of two variables is continuous if, well, frankly, if you can move the limit operator inside the arguments and then you get f of a comma b. Uh, we say a function is continuous on D if it's continuous at every point in D. So that's what continuity means. It's the same thing that you learned back in Calc 1. It's just now it's applied to each individual coordinate. Same idea. Um, now, because we can talk about continuity, we have some really, really nice functions. So again, this is why we love, love, love polynomials. A polynomial function of two variables is a finite sum of terms of the form x times y to the m, y to the n, where c is a constant and m and n are non-negative integers. So we can talk about polynomials of two variables. In fact, all of the examples we have seen so far have polynomials of two variables in them. This is a polynomial of two variables. This is a polynomial of two variables. This is a polynomial of two variables. This is a polynomial in two variables. Those are all polynomials in two variables. Um, back to this. Uh, what is a rational function? So a rational function is a, is a ratio of polynomials. So actually every example that we have seen in this section is a rational function. Let me go back just once. This is a rational function in two variables. That's it. Ratios of polynomials. So we love, love, love polynomials and we love, love, love rational functions because they're just, they're continuous well, polynomials are, well, that's the next part. Sorry, jumping ahead. Boom, this theorem, <laughs> this theorem. All polynomials in n variables are continuous on Rn and all rational functions are continuous on their domain. So we love, love, love polynomials. Polynomials are continuous everywhere. It doesn't matter how many dimensions, how many variables, they're continuous. Rational functions are continuous on their domains. So everywhere except there's restrictions in the denominator, that's it. They're continuous everywhere else, and it doesn't matter the dimension, they're still continuous. Um, another great thing about continuity here, in general, the properties of continuous functions of one variable also hold for multivariable functions. So if you vaguely remember that section from Calc 1, the stuff you learned about the niceties of continuous functions still holds. In particular, a composition of continuous multivariable functions with appropriate domains and ranges is continuous. Appropriate here meaning compatible, right? Like if I take a function whose range is, you know, zero to infinity, and then I take another function whose domain is negative one to negative infinity, I can't, I can't compose them because they don't actually fit together. So as long as the domains and ranges are compatible and your functions are continuous, the composition is also continuous, which we're going to see in a moment. Um, Let's do this example. Okay, so consider this function, f of x comma y equals this, when x, y is not the origin, and zero when it is the origin. My question to you is, where is this function continuous? So think about this for a moment. And now make a claim. Do you think it's continuous or not? Speak it out loud. All right, now prove your claim. If you think it's continuous, my question is where is it continuous and prove it? Right, here we go. All right, is it continuous? Well, first thing I notice is this. This is a rational function. So it is continuous everywhere in its domain. So the only place this function is not defined is at the origin. <laughs> so. It is continuous everywhere else, but we don't know about the origin yet. If we want to know if it's continuous at the origin, we then need to take the limit as we approach the origin and see what we get. And hopefully it is equal to zero. If it's not equal to zero, it's not continuous there. So here we go. This is what I was just saying. It's already, uh, it's, it's a rational function on, oops, that should say R2. R2 minus the point zero, zero. It's continuous there. So the limit at the origin, we actually checked. So that was back in example one. 
So you can follow that link if you want to if you want to go back to it. We found that this actually does approach zero as x comma y approaches the origin. So that means this function is continuous on all of R two. There we go. That's it. All right. How about this one? Question for you to try out again. Where is this function continuous? The function tan inverse of y over x. Think about it for a minute. Right? And say out loud what you think. Where do you think it's going to be continuous? Just a guess. Right. Now prove it. Prove it. Write down where you think it's continuous and see if you can show it's continuous there or justify it in some way. All right, here we go. So let's see. Right off the bat, I can see that there's problems when x is 0 because x is in the denominator here. So if x is 0, we're trying to divide by 0. That can't be. x cannot be 0 for this to be continuous. So it cannot be continuous when x is 0. What other problems do we have? Well, let's think about this. We're doing arctangent of this. Where, let's see, where is arctangent continuous? Let's see, arctan is continuous, inverse tangent. It's continuous on all of R. So we should be okay. We should be okay. I think the only restriction is when x is equal to 0. Let's see if that's right. That's right. Yep. Arctangent is continuous on R. This function is continuous when X is not equal to zero. It's a rational function. So the composition is continuous when X is not equal to zero. And that's it. Let's take a look at the picture. This is why it's nice to look at a picture of these things. Okay, here is the plot of Y equals X. So just the, the inner function. Whoa, okay, now. <laughs> Again, the computer is approximating things here, but we, we got a problem when x is equal to zero, right? So when x is equal to zero, we're trying to divide by zero. So we've got this like asymptotic behavior there, but this is what y over x looks like, basically a, a hyperbola. Here's what arctan of y over x looks like. There it is. So remember, when x equals 0, that's this line, right? When x is equal to 0, that's the, the y-axis. So that's why we have this big old gap, right? Definitely not continuous along the y-axis right there. Huge gap. Huge gap right there. Can't be continuous there. And then you have these little artifacts near the, near the origin, just because, again, Mathematica is trying to approximate this curve as it gets closer and closer to 0. Um, zero comma zero, but that means you're asking it to get really close to dividing by zero and it starts to error out a little bit or maybe not error out, but show you some artifacts because the approximation method is not exact, right? It's, it's, it's exact up to a certain degree of tolerance. All right. Okay. And that's it for continuity. So on that note, let's play. So thank you again for listening to this one. Like I said, this one is a little bit uh, technical. It's a little bit rigorous, but Thankfully, it's not as mind-bending as the last, uh, the last section. So, yep, I'll leave it there. I'll stop rambling, and I'll see you all next time.